When I reached for a tie off my rack this morning, I realized it was probably the wrong thing to wear in a tribute to Frank Cabot. And so for those gentlemen in the room who've ever struggled with doing what I tried to do this morning, I'll just recommend that there are a number of YouTube videos that will teach you how to do that. And the, the Southern gentleman is the best of those. Uh, I've been asked to talk about the future of American gardens and perpetuating Frank's legacy a little bit, and that's appropriate to me as a gardener who's become a garden administrator. Um, and I think it's relevant to Frank as well, because he really was prescient about the future of American gardens in creating the Garden Conservancy and doing other things of that nature. I think he was thinking forward. And so I want to sort of weave in just three quick points about sustainability, about stewardship, and about relevance, which I think attends uh, all gardens, public, private, um, as we go forward. Frank was an advocate for public gardens as much as he was for uh, perpetuating and preserving private ones. And we've heard uh, the number of organizations that he was involved with. He, he was a distinguished advisor to Brooklyn Botanic Garden as well, and uh, really thought a lot about the role of public gardens and, and, and how they might serve a, a growing need, a growing public. I, I knew Frank less well than perhaps some of the other speakers, but I did have the great honor of meeting him a few times, and uh, he came to a talk I gave once and uh, uh, with Carolyn, gave a nice uh, comment to me after my presentations. And I have to think that one of his enduring legacies is that of encouragement of all of us as gardeners, and that's, that's really a boost that has endured with me to have a nice comment from him. Well, so stewardship, sustainability, relevance. Um, as, as the steward of a 100-year-old botanic garden, I always feel that my first responsibility is to be an outstanding steward of the fine work of those who've gone before me. And that's the case in most gardens. You recognize the work of others, and you know that's the first thing, is to really care for that. And I think that's maybe a challenge for those uh, uh, involved in caring for the gardens that Frank helped create in his lifetime, is thinking about that. Um, Frank also was an immensely practical person, as gardeners are, and know, knew that you can't step in the same garden twice, that it's always changing. By the time you've stepped back, it's a different garden. And so, you know, maintaining that design intent as we go forward in, in changing times and changing climates is, is an interesting challenge and one that in, uh, requires that we really think about uh, not so much restoration as rehabilitation with uh, contemporary materials, and that includes plant materials that might not uh, have been available to us previously and those that were may not grow so well. So that, that um, leads me to sustainability because we do live in a different time. I think the story of our time is the story of the loss of biodiversity on the planet and the changing climates. And... Uh, we run a great risk in gardens if we aren't perceived as part of the solution, but could be by staying with older ways as part of the problem. And so that's something that all of us struggle with. Um, at Brooklyn Botanic Garden, we did an environmental audit and tried to look quietly at all of our procurement and our energy use and that kind of stuff. And that, that informs some of our decisions today. And I recommend that to every garden. Really think about you know, where, where things come from, what we're doing. That, that leads to some big challenges ahead, but uh, uh, it's, it's essential. And I think it's, it's just uh, such a joy to see how keen young people are today, certainly here in New York, about the environment, about sustainability. So I think we, perceived as green institutions, have to be as green as we can be. Um, we, we're focusing on a couple things that really might sort of show the way, uh, among many, we could really all look at energy, we could look at invasive species, we could look at the implications of global climate change for us. Um, uh, we're thinking a little bit about water, which is something in the Northeast, you know, not as something we thought as much about. Uh, uh, I came from the West where, you know, horticulture is all about water. Whereas here, you know, we've had the great luxury of having year-round rainfall and, and enjoyed that. Um, so we're looking at our water consumption and about recirculation and that kind of stuff and diminishing our use of fresh water in, in the landscape, also diminishing the, the outflow. We've uh, come up with something 
That's really wonderful. It's called the Intelligent Sewer Management Model. And I've told the board there shall be no more dumb sewers at Brooklyn Botanic Garden, just the smart ones. But really, it's about uh, how using really good weather data, you could diminish how much uh, stormwater you're, you're putting out in a, in a rainstorm. So there's a lot of opportunities, and I think that's a big focus and a big uh, uh, essential uh, direction for public gardens in the future. Um, we live in an increasingly urbanized world, and you know cer certainly in New York we feel that. We've, we've just had uh, 40,000 visitors this weekend, nearly 200,000 this month, and you know when I walk around the garden when it, on those busy days, and you know not so relevant to smaller private gardens emerging, but you see this incredible diversity of people. Everybody's there, and they are sort of their best selves. They're the best people they are, and they're showing such lovely courtesies to one another. It's it's such an inspiration. And when you see that, you think, gosh, if there's anything we need on the planet, we def we definitely need love, but we need more gardens because this is the thing that will give us. Um, you know, that really give us hope for the future. So I really think we're all doing great work in providing those, those places of sanctuary and beauty and inspiration to people. Um, so relevance, you know, it's a, it's a tough one. Most of us in the public garden world are really having to build new audiences and not just taking for granted that people will recognize that we're important and that these things are good. And so we do programming and things to invite and to sort of entice people to become involved. And those festivals and exhibitions and things are wonderful sort of introductions to the world of gardens. You have to start somewhere, and so it's a great one. Similarly, in science and environmental education, um, you know, those early experiences in, in a child's life are so important. You don't just naturally come to a major in biology or in science in college. You really have to have some link to that in your youth. And so what gardens do in environmental education is, is really, really important. We couldn't do anything more so, I don't think. Um, that said, with all this exhibition and uh, um, sort of festival stuff and everything, we, we don't really want to lose sight of the fact that we have a unique niche in the world and in cultural programming, which is about plants and about a passion for plants and for gardens. And there is uh, Frank's legacy perhaps most succinctly described, and that's what all of us in this room need to carry forward and inspire others and inspire others to support gardens and local gardens. So thank you so much.